Uh, this session uh, basically will discuss how we can mobilize international coordination and uh, or to address uh, migration governance and reflect on concrete policies and programs to prevent, address, and sustainable resolve migrant vulnerability. Uh, discussions uh, will consider a variety of uh, approaches, regional and uh, international, uh, to address migrant vulnerability and explore how to mainstream these approaches into the development of the global compact. Uh, we will have the opportunity to really examine this from completely different perspectives, as we have a representative of a government, a regional body, the UN, and the private sector. So basically, all trying to incorporate all the different stakeholders uh, in the elaboration of the uh, Global Compact. So let me start by introducing briefly uh, the colleagues that are sitting uh, with me. First of all, on my right, uh, you know him already. He had not only uh, been part of a panel already in this uh, IDM, but uh, uh, he, he served as a chair in office of the Global Forum on Migration and Development, Mr. Uh, Shahidul Haq, uh, foreign, uh, foreign Secretary of the Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh since 2013, and an extremely appreciated colleague before that here in IOM. Uh, he is also serving as an independent expert to the Committee on the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families uh, for the term 2014-2017. Uh, I'm also pleased to present Ambassador Mahbub Malin, uh, the Executive Secretary of the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, IGAD, since 2008. Uh, IGAD, IGAD is, for those that uh, you're not familiar with the term, uh, the primary, to, uh, primary objective is to promote the economic development, peace and security, and regional integration uh, in, in the South. Uh, prior to this assignment, Ambassador Malin served as a permanent uh, secretary at the Ministry uh, of State for Special Programs in the Office of the President and the Ministry of Water and Irrigation of Kenya. Also, we have with us Ms. Christine Matthews, that is the uh, Senior Policy Advisor to the Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General on Migration. Uh, prior to, to this, uh, Ms. Matthews worked with uh, U, uh, UNHCR as Deputy Director, i.e. of uh, UNHCR's office in New York, uh, which engaged uh, uh, extensively in the preparation of the New York Declaration, so she's, she's a, a well-known person uh, in New York. Uh, over the, her 20-year uh, career, she has served in a vast array of field operations addressing multiple complex and contracted refugee and displaced emergencies. And finally, we have uh, our representative of the private sector, uh, Mirella Stoya, the director of the immigration service of PricewaterhouseCoopers in uh, Switzerland, where she is responsible for uh, leading the immigration practice of PwC Switzerland providing clients with a range of immigration services. And Ms. Stoya is also a member of PwC's Immigration Network Leaders Team. So I welcome all of you uh, very warmly to this panel. Thank you very much for your uh, participation. And uh, in order to try to start a little bit the discussion, I would like to, to ask uh, uh, two or three questions uh, through which maybe uh, you can uh, elaborate a little bit further. Is the first one is what roles do the various actors that you represent have in preventing and addressing migrant vulnerability? Uh, second, how can international cooperation and coordination efforts to address migrant vulnerability and empower migrants be strengthened? And what is where? Well, concrete uh, proposals about that, and how can the multilateral system foster discussions and consensus on the inclusion of these issues in the Global Compact on Migration. Without any more further delay, uh, I have the honor to give the floor to Mr. Hake. Thank you very much, um, distinguished uh, Deputy Director General. Uh, I have a 
PowerPoint to share with you today, because in the other panel, I, I realized that I, have, I must have confused you a lot. So let's bring in some bit of a clarity towards the end. And I have titled uh, my presentation as Vi Migrant Vulnerability and the Global Compact. Uh, I will try and uh, share with you focusing on three areas. First is try and see whether we could have some bit of a conceptual clarity in terms of migrant vulnerability, picking up from the deliberations that we had over the last two days. And then what, what is the challenge that normally a state faces? I've been asked to focus more on state in terms of ensuring that people are not moving in a vulnerable situation. And the uh, third, where I'll take a little more time to share with you uh, ideas about migrant compact. Um, so this is how uh, I will I'll go. Uh, before I do that, I would like to sort of a flag that migrants does not become vulnerable in a vacuum. There is a situation, there is uh, internal and external uh, factors and forces that often push people to become vulnerable, not only as migrants, but also as individuals. So that we need to keep in mind. And for that, I normally use uh, uh, this particular slide where uh, I try and explain uh, what is the contemporary migration space that we are talking about. We often feel that migration is a very technical issue. It is labor mobility, uh, and that's what it is not. It is a geopolitical issue. Migr migrants and migration plays out in, in, in the bigger context of geopolitics and geoeconomics. That we have to keep in contact, and that's from where a lot of vulnerability comes out. Now, if you look at the left from my side, there's a changing development paradigm and there's a changing geopolitics, which works together to create a world which we are currently seeing, which is going through a huge transformation. The world that we see, even for migrants today, uh, wasn't there 10 years back. And ne in next 10 years, the world will change for all of us, including for migrants. So that we have to keep uh, uh, in, in context in order to identify the vulnerability that occurs in the process of mobility. And that is why we, uh, in our uh, uh, foreign relations parallel, we say the world is passing through a very uncertain period and which uh, we uh, often uh, like to call tumultuous time. And in this tumultuous time, it's not only migrants, the rest, 97% of people often feel extremely vulnerable uh, and face risk. So this is what the context. <clears throat> as I said that, uh, as I said that I will try and conceptualize uh, migrant vulnerability, that is extremely important. I picked it up from the deliberations, both in the uh, IOM's presentations and some of our discussions, it was very clear that migrant vulnerability is still an ambiguous term and often very fluid. You know, we, we don't know wh what it means. Uh, so that's uh, there. But when a phenomena is ambiguous and fluid, there's a, there's a need to conceptualize it for the benefit of uh, protection and, and other reasons. And we, we can look at it in a different way. I'll try in two ways. That migrants' vulnerability refers to inability of migrants to effectively address or deal with adverse effect of migratory process. So it's a very simplistic, non-legal way of narrating it. Second, it could be more little mathematical, and it could be a function of three things. One is the migrant's ability to survive in an adverse situation. So I put it in a more positive uh, twist first. But that's not the end. The second one is the capacity to return to normal life and livelihood. That's the second. There are uh, many situations from which migrants can come out quite successful. And the last is the larger socioeconomic and political situation which determines uh, whether someone would be vulnerable or wouldn't be vulnerable. Now, the core of these definitions is what you call access to resources and power. If you have these two, you are never vulnerable in any circumstances. So we have to go back to that fundamental issues. And within that context, we have to think of migrants' vulnerability. There are broad four kinds of flow. Yeah? This is not something uh, written in stone, but for our own simplicity and for more under my own understanding, I look at the global flows in this form, and that's how 
we will try and look at the compact. First is the migration for sustainable development, with talent mobility, <coughs> mobility for a job, and all kinds of flows, where we actually need very little intervention. Uh, if you take compact, uh, possibly compact will focus less on that. And then comes the whole issue of irregular migration and human trafficking. There we have Palermo Declaration, we have little more structured interventions, in uh, uh, both in terms of national and, uh, and international uh, instruments. So that's the second flow. The third flow, where it is really with the huge gap and vagueness, is the cross-border displacement. And I think the, the most vulnerability that arises during the mobility is from the cross-border displacement. And the third is refugees, for which there is a regime and, and, uh, and, uh, um, and much more structured system. Now, this is what the four uh, flow that, uh, that I think we can, we can think of and then look at uh, uh, how to protect uh, their rights. Now, what are the challenges in doing so? Why a state fails to take care of these four flows and, and create interventions or protections and rights? Where is the challenge? The first challenge that state face, and I'm representing a state I know because uh, uh, we have uh, uh, a, a, a a similar problem. We are an origin country, destination country, uh, and, uh, uh, and a transit country. Um, the, the state often struggles to balance between economic gain that one can make out of migratory processes and maintaining state security. That's an extremely critical, delicate balancing act that state operators often struggle with. On one hand, the state has to decide so that people can go abroad, send all kinds of a financial and non-financial benefit. But at the same time, the state is struggled with the situation where the security comes in, the national security. So that's one dilemma. And that's why often most of the vulnerable people uh, fails to get the protection from the state. Second, the traditional conflict between the state sovereignty and the universal human rights of citizens. And we continue to struggle how much uh, uh, rights we would entitle to our own citizens and non-citizens who are in, my, in our country as, uh, as migrants um, or uh, refugees. So this is the true struggle that the state often goes. And that's why I think within the compact, we'll see huge debate, the, the root the, uh, the sense of this uh, discussion on non-convergence will come out of it. And the third, which possibly we can address in longer term, is the capacity and resources to manage or govern migration. Migration, most of the states, especially the developing countries, um, started addressing these issues 20, 25 years back. Before that, they thought, the state thought, this is a temporary phenomenon. It doesn't need governance. So in the last 20, 25 years, the state, including my own, realized that, no, this is something we have to deliberately plan and address. So this is what the three challenges. And these challenges, as long as we cannot address, it will continue to haunt us not only in the vulnerable context, but also in many other contexts. Quick. I, I wanted to give this clarity before uh, we move in. Now, although in the compact first time we talked about orderly, safe, regular, but if you go back in goal 17, target 10C, you'll see there was another concept which is called responsible. There has to be responsibility sharing also. We cannot continue to go and talk about orderly, safe, and regular without talking about the responsibility of all stakeholders. So that should also be brought in when we would have the negotiations. Okay. Uh, in uh, April, 2016, when there was a discussion in the UN uh, about, uh, uh, about uh, the September event, there was initially a discussion to have a compact for the refugees and something else for the migrants. And that's the time uh, Bangladesh, uh, as, a GMG, as a GFMD chair, wrote a letter to the, the then Deputy Secretary General. And in that letter, uh, we outlined a, a, a proposal as to how the global compact on migration uh, would or should look like. And in that letter, 
uh, we uh, had six approaches uh, that we uh, outlined. And some bit of it still survived in the final report. First one is the opportunity and challenge of migration deserves to be weighted in an integrated manner within the broader context of development context. We cannot take migration out of the development context and put it in the security context and deal with it. That was the first we wrote in our letter. Second, if you're talking about not leaving anyone, don't leave migrants behind, well, especially the vulnerable migrants who need your help more than anyone else. Third, we need a new way of governing migration. It cannot be de dealt with the traditional way of approaching, uh, and which uh, I, I will come back later. And then you have to have a peace and stability along the migration pathway. If there's no peace and stability along the migration pathway, then possibly you'd have more vulnerabilities and, and conflict. And then implement normative frameworks and need for a bold, focused, and measurable migration compact. We say we have to also measure the way we're measuring SDGs and others. So this is the six areas uh, we thought. And we also laid down some bigger element as to what that need to be there in the compact. Uh, I'm glad that some bit of it survived. Uh, naturally, others will try and see how it comes out in the, in the bigger uh, context. So this is the background of the compact. I think you need to know as to how it e evolved. Uh, I'll not go into that. Now we have, now Bangladesh thinks we have possibilities of four different kind of an instrument that we could negotiate. First, we can go for a migration convention, which would be binding in nature, one option. Second, we can go for guiding principles and guidelines, which would be non-binding, but uh, hopefully there'll be enough consensus to take it forward. Then third is that we could have an SDG type instrument where there'll be, we are in the process of drafting a paper, five migration goal, along with at least 15 migration target, and then we'll see indicator based on the countries, which is basically SDG model. That could also be negotiated and then, uh, uh, then implemented. And or we could have the fourth option, which is more of a, like a Paris Agreement on Climate Change, where part of the instrument could be binding on all of us, and rest of it, which where we'll have no convergence of opinion, could have a, uh, could be included, but voluntary in nature. States could accept, couldn't accept. So these are the four different types that we think eventually we'll see the instrument is coming out. What's the way forward? I'm, this is my last slide. The most important thing right now is the leadership from the state. The process has to be led by state, and there, there has to be leadership. And leadership has to be ambitious, but at the same time balanced. Second, and uh, I saw that has also been, uh, came out in the last session, we cannot politicize or securitize migration. If you do it, rest of our civilization will struggle to govern it. So, try and, it, migration is a political issue, but don't politicize it. Even it is equally applicable for my own country. If there are questions, I will say how we have resolved this in Bangladesh. And there's a, there's a need for UN system-wide coordination. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very sort of a happy that I can say this here positively, but there's a huge negative aspect of it. And that's why the leadership of the state is so crucial. But in order to take forward this very heavily loaded, fluid idea of mobility and migration, we have to have a new and constructive partnership. Breaking the UN's normal traditional partnership. Here, you need a much more innovative partnership. Time has come for a new migration compact. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hake. And let me now give the floor to Ambassador Malin uh, for your intervention. Thank you. Thank you. Very well. well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Uh, for the Horn of Africa, um, 
migration is as old as mankind. And um, in all the readings I do and all the uh, listening that I, I do, hardly does this, this narrative come out. And in the Horn of Africa, normally, at that time, there has been various terminologies used by local groups over the years to describe vulnerability. And migration was because of three main reasons. One was basically on drought. The other one was on raids. And the last one, another list, was on disease outbreaks. Unfortunately, fast forward so many thousands of years later, the three factors are still uh, are domiciled in the region. And the, the, the normal system of self-cleansing early on where droughts would come, there will be a regenerative, the regeneration of the vegetation, and life would come back to normality, is now no more because of encroached range, rangelands and changed situations. And so are raids, uh, because the raids, which used to be ordinarily uh, something which was aimed at basically taking away uh, property, mainly in form of livestock, uh, by young men, as a basis for paying bride price, for example, without being seen to um, uh, bother or, or to put too much pressure on his, his or her parents uh, and, and acquire for himself, now turned into basically almost like warfare and into an armed and militarized uh, kind of um, uh, fights, mainly with political or ideological reasons. And so are diseases outbreaks, so much, so much more outbreaks in terms of some of the mainly livestock diseases in the region, trypanosomiasis, rinderpest, and what have you. Uh, and, and the fact that some of these are with the diminished rangelands, the situation is worse than it was over time. And therefore, these are still the basis for uh, some of the migration that we see that has traditionally been uh, the hallmark of the Horn of Africa. Uh, dilapita you know, the dilapidation of the uh, ecosystems and vulnerability of the ecosystems and lack of resilience, for example. So three quick main areas, just to give you an impression of what our view are on this. One, as actors on the ground and as, a, as an organization that has membership of uh, uh, countries in the Horn of Africa, as local actors, uh, we aim as a contribution to any compact of migration uh, to provide platform, the necessary platforms, uh, provide a stable level base upon which uh, all issues and discussions and parameters that are required to be put in place uh, can, be, can be used as a building block. Therefore, pro provide that, that platform uh, is, is important that we are, we are doing, and we're doing this through our con each country, what we call uh, the national coordination uh, mechanisms at our country levels. Uh, at the regional level, we provide uh, political leverage uh, co uh, and cooperation, as well as an operational platform uh, where uh, migration issues, which otherwise uh, is obvious, cannot be done within the premise of only one country's border, uh, is, is done between uh, our countries on an open border uh, system. We have recent, recently launched many programs that are cross, cross regional uh, programs, and migration being one of those examples, I would benefit from this. Um, and this also gives an opportunity for dialogue, so member states discuss. Uh, periodically among themselves, and of course on invitation by the rest of you and with IOM all the time, being um, chief technical groups that support uh, the region on issues of uh, migration. We have uh, relationships in kind of uh, programming. Uh, but at the same time, we have also, uh, as a region, developed and finalized our regional migration policy and an associated migration action plan, which we think forms the basis for our contribution to any further discussions uh, at the global level when it comes to uh, promulgation of the, of the global compact. Uh, recently, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we've had a member states consultation on the GCM, uh, where we already have our own uh, position, which we think is going to be part and parcel of our contribution to the African Union agenda. And therefore, as we, as we go towards uh, the General Assembly, we will be prepared as a region and again as a, as, a, as a continent. In March this year, we convened the Heads of State Summit, where the Heads of States of EGAD uh, deliberated on the issues of 
uh, durable solutions to, on, on refugee issues in our, in our region. And if you look at the matrix uh, of the action plan of that uh, deliberation, uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, migration issues because of the thin line between uh, migration and, uh, and, 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 and refugees. And therefore, this we think is already a basis for, uh, for adaptation, for understanding, and for partnership. Um, secondly, at the international scenario, uh, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the, um, the international scenario, we call upon uh, proper coordination, which we think really is right now uh, pretty much wanting. We think that if we put the question to everybody here, are we going to be coordinated on this? Everybody most probably is going to answer yes. The problem will be when we call for the first meeting next Tuesday, and then we start getting people quoting subsections of their regulations on why to not coordinate. This is important. Uh, we also uh, provide uh, an operational uh, point of anchor uh, for the operations of any programming that we think uh, internationally and globally agreed upon, but that uh, slips through the fingers because of the tragedy of the commons. Look at examples of uh, the Khartoum process. Look at examples of the Valletta process. Excellent processes, excellent agreements, high-level uh, you know, consultations. Very well done. But what is the results? We had a couple of very quick meetings over uh, successively and very close to each other over, long, over some time. Then the meetings started becoming uh, very far apart. And now I think there are no more meetings almost. But if we had the kind of operational anchor that we provide as a regional organization, then we'll go to these international conferences to, to provide uh, a status of uh, some of the operations of that agreement at our region. And this can be done in all other regions, the ASEAN region, southern region, western region. I think this is going to be, this is going to help us stand against the tragedy of the commons where we have very, very uh, um, high level agreements and you know, priority areas that they would never follow. Um, right now, we're suffering from that, as I said, the tragedy of the commons. And lastly, on the multilateral systems, and here I'm talking about the multilateral finance institutions. Uh, I think here we need to call upon multilateral, multilateral finance institutions to uh, develop appropriate instruments uh, for financing, because I think financing is core to everything that we do. Uh, right now, there are specific windows that are aimed at um, uh, budgetary allocations to member states only. We need to expand to have regional allocations. We need to expand to have specific uh, priority area allocations that then people can pro uh, develop concepts against and borrow against. Member states must be, must be ready to borrow against a common programming framework and borrow for a common purpose on things like this that, are, that have a global implication. So I think these are issues that we think we need to take it up for discussion uh, when the, the main discussion comes as we run down uh, towards the Global Compact. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, let me now give the floor to Ms. Matthews. Thank you. Deputy Director, Excellencies, Distinguished Panelists, Ladies and Gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to speak today at the International Dialogue on Migration. I'm honored to deliver the following remarks on behalf of the Special Representative of the Secretary General, Ms. Louise Arbour. Ms. Arbour spoke at the IDM in April of this year, noting that our task is formidable and our timelines are tight, but we are on the eve of harnessing the positive forces of human mobility and setting a new course for governance of international migration. Our efforts will be transformative for the lives of millions, our fellow human beings, our neighbors. We have moved forward quickly towards this end, towards better governance of international migration. Three of the th six thematic sessions of the preparatory phase for the Global Compact on Migration have taken place. These include sessions on human rights of migrants, drivers of migration, and governance. These discussions to date have highlighted many key areas of convergence, which together with the sessions to come, I am sure, will lay the groundwork for the stock taking meeting in December, the zero draft of the Global Compact, and the subsequent intergovernmental negotiations. 
A key area of convergence, most relevant for today's discussion, continues to be the recognition that as human rights are universal and apply to all migrants, there is an interest of member states to ensuring the concrete implementation of human rights in practical terms. While we continue to seek to define terminology around vulnerable migrants, in the, the heart of the matter is clear that whether we are speaking of vulnerable migrants such as unaccompanied children or victims of trafficking, or we are speaking of migrants in vulnerable situations such as those abused by smugglers or abandoned on unseaworthy ships, all have specific needs that must be met in accordance with international law, particularly international human rights law. We should avoid becoming bogged down in debates around definitions and terminology. While recognizing the legal distinction between refugees and migrants, it's evident that specific vulnerabilities requiring specific humanitarian and assistance responses affect individuals in both groups, irrespective of their legal status and of the reasons that propelled or compelled them to move. It is evident that the existing legal frameworks, both national and international, provide sufficient basis for the protection of migrants who are vulnerable due to individual characteristics or due to circumstance. For migrants, while the basis for protection is clear, there are gaps in both the specificity of measures to be taken as well as implementation. For refugees, the specific protection needs are addressed through the body of international refugee law and its domestic implementation. It's important to recognize that incomplete and inconsistent application of the relevant legal frameworks, which results in gaps, requires a more robust implementation, not new legislation. In facilitating orderly and regular migration, the end goal, improved migration governance will make significant progress towards preventing migrants from becoming vulnerable in the first instance and meeting the specific needs of those with existing vulnerabilities. International cooperation aimed at increasing regular pathways for migration will reduce vulnerability of migrants. Better governance in, and international cooperation can reduce the drivers of irregular migration, provide alternatives for those resorting to risky journeys, combat smuggling and trafficking, mitigate the risks of exploitation of migrants, and increase the ability of states and stakeholders to identify those most at risk, providing them with appropriate protection and assistance. The Global Compact on Migration is an opportunity for states to develop a comprehensive framework for international cooperation on international migration, a framework that reconciles individual states' own, own responsibilities and interests with those of the international community more broadly. The success of the Global Compact of Migration will depend on effective international cooperation and political leadership. The compact provides a unique opportunity to address some of the gaps and shortcomings in the way states co cooperate with one another on migration governance. In order to be effective in advancing cooperation and promoting good governance, it will be important for the global compact to rest on agreed international commitments, including reflecting the people-centered spirit of the SDGs. The global compact should provide a practical roadmap on how to achieve the SDG target 10.7, facilitating, facilitating orderly, safe, regular, and responsible migration and mobility of people, including through the implementation of a planned and well-managed migration policies. It should deal with all aspects of international migration, including development linkages, human rights protection, humanitarian needs, and the institutional framework on migration more broadly. This framework will include cooperation between states, but it will also need the expertise and participation of non-governmental organizations, civil society organizations, academic institutions, parliaments, diaspora communities, the private sector, national human rights institutions, migrant organizations, and the migrants themselves. All have important roles to play. In conclusion, we need collectively to strengthen the narrative, one which has the virtue of truth that recognizes human mobility and diversity as a contribution to evolving societies and strong economies, and devise a global compact in that spirit. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now to conclude, uh, Ms. Stoye, uh, your remarks from the private sector perspective. 
Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I would like to start by thanking the IOM and in particular Mrs. Laura Thompson, the Deputy Director General of the IOM, for allowing a private sector representative to participate in this dialogue on the very important topic of migrant vulnerability. The workshop to date has sought to define the concept of vulnerable migrants, understand what factors exacerbate the vulnerabilities, and what actions can be taken to mitigate the issues faced by vulnerable migrants, for example, racism, marginalization of migrants, and human rights abuses. From a private sector perspective, we tend to deal with migrants who arrive in host countries through legitimate and regular routes. Thus, this means the extent of migrant vulnerability encountered by us is not at the same level as those who engage with migrants arriving into a host countries as refugees, victims of trafficking or irregular routes. However, this does not mean to say that migrants arriving to work for a private company through a work permit scheme or are not vulnerable. It is simply that the challenges they may face and the means to address these may slightly differ. Nonetheless, the empowerment of migrants in whatever capacity they arrive into a host country can be achieved through the same means. Migrants coming to a host country in order to take up pre-approved employment or join family members may have the support of the employers or their families together with financial support. However, they may still face the following challenges which can result in them becoming vulnerable and marginalized members of our communities. Racism and xenophobia, language barriers, cultural barriers, for example, not being familiar with work ethics, working patterns, work processes, day-to-day -day cultural norms and traditions of the host country. This could be something as simple as queuing. Administrative processes relating to registration, school or banking. Understanding the requirement to obtain a certain type of insurance, for example, health insurance or a car insurance. And procedures for accessing medical and healthcare services. Accessing emergency services. Or last but not least, social etiquette. For example, engaging socially with work colleagues outside of work. These challenges are broadly the same as those experienced by migrants arriving via irregular migration routes. However, it is acknowledged that migrants arriving, for example, as refugees or victims of trafficking, are more likely not just to encounter these challenges, but also to face them in a much harsher form, given that they do not have the support circles comprising of their families, colleagues and employers. It is important to recognize, however, that even some migrants arriving via regular migration routes may be exposed to challenges in a harsh form, particularly if they are being exploited by unscrupulous employers or victims, for example, of forced marriages. Private sector organizations must ensure that they operate processes and policies whilst providing full support and opportunity for migrants to address the challenges they face, whilst empowering them to assist others in the same situation. Private sector and organi uh, sector organizations must firstly acknowledge the challenges that may, fa may be faced by migrants who are either permanent hires or international assignees. Secondly, private actors, in particular multinational companies, could operate and implement the following processes. Pre-arrival cultural orientation sessions and relocation support for migrants who will be arriving in the host country. Provision of local host country HR or global mobility contact point with whom migrants can raise their concerns and seek support and guidance. Arrival orientation, training and guidance with regards to local customs, work processes and signposting to services such as healthcare, schools and so on. Regular points for 6 to 12, 12 month period at which the host country HR, global mobility contact, 
checks in with a migrant to discuss any concerns, issues, well-being and obtain general feedback. Ongoing communication, training and engagement with all staff regarding diversity and discrimination policies to ensure that migrants feel welcome and host country employees understand the necessity for respect and tolerance. Engagement with government bodies, bodies and policy makers through responding to consultation and requests for contribution to policy making to ensure that immigration rules and regulations, both existing and proposed, will not be discriminatory to migrants and afford the same employment rights as far as practicable to migrants as those applicable to resident workers. Whereas immigration conditions may be imposed on migrants, it is important for the private sector to challenge and represent the interest of both the business and its migrant workforce to ensure migrants do not suffer detriment from a career perspective and any immigration policies allow migrant integration into the host country. Conversely, private sector organizations, employers should not make recommendations to policymakers while we, which will result in undercutting the resident labor market whilst enabling exploitation of migrant workers. Legislative and government bodies charged with immigration policy making must ensure that in incorporating the interests of the private sector into any immigration laws, any vulnerabilities faced by migrants will not be exacerbated. Private sectors, sector organizations and employers must also ensure that there is an educational strategy in place which enables stakeholders to recognize and support particularly vulnerable migrants who may be employed within the organizations, for example, refugees. Private sector actors need to be aware of and acknowledge the different support mechanisms that will be necessary to address the vulnerabilities of specific types of migrants, for example, refugees of victim or victims of trafficking. For example, additional counseling services, confidential advice and support contacts for particularly vulnerable migrants should be made available. Further, stakeholders involved in the recruitment and retention of particular vulnerable, vulnerable migrants must have the appropriate training and support available to them so that they can address the vulnerabilities of such migrants whilst enabling their empowerment. The private sector can play a key role in helping empower migrants through the internal processes and support procedures. And advocating on behalf of migrants and the value they bring to the workforce. For example, migrants may suffer xenophobia and by advocating on behalf of migrants, private sector actors can outline the benefits of having a diverse and multi multicultural workforce that can compete in an increasingly globalized market whilst emphasizing migrants' contribution to the economic and industrial strategy of a host country. For example, by addressing demographic, demographic challenges. In doing so, private sector actors with the power of their brands can reassure the public and help address negative perceptions on migrants, which in turn can lead to empowering migrants as they will feel more included and integrated in the host community. It is important for private sector organizations and employers to share best practices and engage with one another with regards to the mechanisms and processes that can address migrant vulner vulnerabilities. Sharing of best practice at local, national and international level can lead to a consistent effi and efficient approach in addressing migrant vulnerabilities and empowering migrants. Private sector engagement with policymakers at all levels is also important as reviewing practices in other jurisdictions can lead to international cooperation and coordination of consistent policies, such as dealt with by the GFMD business mechanism. In conclusion, in the last 12 to 24 months, there has been an increased focus on engaging the private sector on thought leadership with regards to the integration and empowerment of migrants, both regular and irregular, and the GFMD business mechanism has been playing a very important and active role in this process. 
it is crucial that this engagement continues as private sector organizations can use the power of their brands to support integration and inclusion initiatives as they pertain to migrants. Further, private sector organizations operate on a global level and can utilize their extensive networks and experience to share best practices and advice on not just the theoretical aspects of addressing migrant vulnerabilities, but also the practical steps that can be taken to implement mechanisms to empower migrants. Inclusion of private sector organizations in multilateral systems, roundtable and conferences is an ideal opportunity for the sharing of ideas with the NGOs, government agencies and those operating on the ground. Further, the private sector can learn from those directly involved in the humanitarian and policy arenas as they relate to migrants. In doing so, private sector actors can better focus their HR strategy not just for employing migrants, but for the benefit of talent acquisition. Specifically, if private sector actors can better understand the push and pull factors which instigate migrant movement from their home countries, they can look at their global expansion and business strategies to evaluate whether they can take advantage or provide opportunities to individuals based in jurisdictions which are the focus of any such strategic plans. This can potentially lead to business growth for private sector organizations in countries of interest, whilst assisting with the economic development of those countries. This can, in some ways, stem the flow of migrant migration where this is instigated by lack of economic opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much for having shared with us the experiences and very practical points about what the private sector can do to help all of us in, in this process. Uh, now I would like to, to open the floor, thanking the, the four panelists for their presentations. Uh, I would like to open the floor, uh, and I have already several uh, requests for the floor. Let me start by El Salvador. Muchas gracias, directora. Agradecemos a todas las delegaciones que han compartido valiosa información sobre las buenas prácticas que están llevando a cabo dentro de sus países con el fin de atender a los migrantes. Consideramos que los diferentes puntos de vista expresados por todos en estos dos días nos ha llevado a un diálogo franco y que nos ayudará a encontrar convergencias. Un punto de gran importancia que todos hemos destacado, que todos los migrantes son sujetos de derechos y se les deben respetar, que las vulnerabilidades tienen diferentes factores externos, situación personal de cada migrante, así como las condiciones del país de origen. Se mencionaron algunos como la edad, género, situación económica, falta de, de documentación, discapacidades, niños detenidos, entre otros. Sin embargo, consideramos que esto no quiere decir que existan otros migrantes que no son vulnerables. Lo que nos debemos centrar es que se deben garantizar los derechos de todos los migrantes y que se les debe de dar la atención especial a aquellos en que se encuentran en situaciones vulnerables. Consideramos que es necesario que exista una voluntad política para poder avanzar y que todos los países, tanto de origen, tránsito y destino, tienen responsabilidades compartidas, por lo que se debe trabajar conjuntamente para proteger y respetar los derechos humanos de todos los migrantes. La elaboración de este Pacto Mundial es una oportunidad única para mejorar la gobernanza de la migración, en la que se respeten los derechos de todos los migrantes, que los Estados cumplan con sus obligaciones internacionales y en donde consideren la inclusión social, la educación, el acceso a la salud como elementos necesarios para encontrar y para encarar las vulnerabilidades de los migrantes. Nos congratulamos que la mayoría ha expresado la necesidad de trabajar en entender los problemas y las necesidades de los migrantes, en especial los grupos de migrantes en situación vulnerable, en particular los niños no acompañados. El Salvador espera que en el documento final que acordaremos en el 2018 se haga una referencia especial a las necesidades de atender la situación de los grupos vulnerables de migrantes, como es niños migrantes no acompañados, y la urgencia de velar por la, porque se prevalezca siempre el interés superior del niño. Esperamos que el pacto sea un instrumento que apoya los objetivos del desarrollo sostenible para que se pueda lograr lo que acordamos, que nadie se quede atrás. Muchas gracias. Gracias, El Salvador. Libia, you have the floor. Madam moderator, we would just say that uh, Libya is committed to protecting, respecting, and promoting 
human rights of migrants, regardless of their status. And we believe that the grievous violation of human rights of migrants is to let them fall in the hands of smugglers, human traffickers, organized crime networks. We better stand together in the countries of origin, transit, and destination, hand in hand, to help as we do agree to fight and counter terrorism. We should stand together and counter smugglers and human traffickers because they are the only cause of this plight of migrants. We do believe in this, and also I want everybody here to know that we are not criminalizing irregular migration per se, because it's uh, on itself, in nature, is irregular and it's against the law. So I know that migrants are human beings, just like you and me, just like everybody. They ha it means every human being has good and evil. I know that there are many smart migrants contribute positively to the economy of the host countries. But don't forget that there are other migrants who contribute negatively by, ex by import exporting crim uh, crimes into the societies they're going to be integrated to. This is something we should not ignore because we're all human beings. So again, uh, thanks very much for hosting such a workshop and we're looking forward to the day when we're going to have a, a real instrument, a legal instrument for safe, orderly and regular migration. I thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you. And now I will give the floor to IIRO. أحب أشكر مديرة الجلسة السيدة لورا والمتحدثين وبهذه المناسبة إن هيئة الإغاثة الإسلامية العالمية ومن هذا المنبر الدولي تشكر حكومة بنغلاديش بقيادة دولة رئيسة الوزراء فخامة الشيخة حسينة لما تقدمه من تسهيلات للعمل الإنساني رغم الكوارث التي الطبيعية التي تمر بها بنغلاديش أنا عملت في دولة بنغلاديش في أرض الميدان وأشكرهم شكرا جزيلا لما قدموه من تسهيلات للعمل الإنساني رغم الظروف والكوارث الطبيعية التي تمر بها بنغلاديش من هذا المنبر أشكر Thank you very much. Senegal. Alors, merci beaucoup, Madame la Directrice Générale Adjointe. Je remercie aussi les panélistes pour la qualité de leur intervention. En raison du temps limité qui nous est accordé, j'avais plusieurs commentaires à faire durant ce, ce panel, mais je m'efforcerai de les résumer en quatre points qui porterait sur le pacte mondial sur la migration. Euh, la toute première concerne la nature du pacte donc qu'a euh, développé euh, M. Hack. J'ai beaucoup apprécié euh, sa présentation parce que c'est une question que je m'attendais depuis plusieurs mois, euh, depuis le début du processus de consultation. Voilà. Mais ce point-là n'avait pas été abordé. Et, voilà. et, et là, euh, la question principale que je soulève est qu'on s'achemine vers euh, la négociation d'un projet qui suscite euh, une grande importance, le pacte mondial sur la migration, mais jusqu'à présent, euh, on ne sait pas est-ce qu'on va adopter un instrument juridiquement contraignant, est-ce qu'on va adopter des principes généraux, est-ce qu'on va adopter un programme à l'image des ODD ou bien, comme l'a dit le professeur Hack tout à l'heure, euh, un instrument à l'image de l'accord de Paris. 
Voilà. Et là, je pense qu'aussi, vraiment, ça mériterait d'être élucidé. Parce que le fait de s'engager dans des négociations intergouvernementales, et on ne sait pas encore pour le moment le document final qui pourrait être adopté pour constituer une limite pour euh, la suite des négociations. Le second point que je voudrais aborder concerne le leadership donc des, des États, qu'a euh, aussi prôné le professeur Hack. À ce niveau aussi, j'aimerais juste appeler l'attention le fait que les États incarnent ce leadership-là. Est-ce que ça ne pourrait pas atténuer la contribution des acteurs non gouvernementaux, notamment euh, la société civile et le secteur privé On sait que ce sont les acteurs gouvernementaux qui apportent une précieuse contribution dans le processus de négociation de ce, de ce euh, pacte-là. Là aussi, c'est une question que je voudrais vraiment soulever. Et le troisième point concerne la contribution de, de l'OIM. Parce que comme nous le savons tous, l'OIM incarne un rôle important dans le processus de négociation. Et là, je voudrais juste suggérer que euh, la contribution de l'OIM dépasse l'aspect coordination et le secrétariat qu'ils ont. Parce que vu l'expérience qu'ils ont capitalisée, ils pourront apporter beaucoup plus durant le processus de négociation. Et le dernier point auquel je terminerai concerne euh, le pacte. Est-ce que le pacte mondial sur la migration répondra-t-il à nos attentes Là, euh, le Sénégal, par exemple, euh, pourrait euh, s'inspirer de plusieurs programmes universels qui ont été adoptés au sein des Nations Unies, mais à ce jour, euh, ces programmes-là ne sont pas suivis d'effet, c'est-à-dire qu'il n'y a pas une mise en œuvre effective. Et, et après avoir adopté ces programmes-là, tous les États applaudissent, tous les acteurs s'en réduisent, mais au bout du compte, ça ce n'est jamais suivi d'effet. Et là, vraiment, je souhaiterais que euh, le pacte mondial sur la migration échappe à cette malédiction et une fois que ce pacte-là serait adopté, qu'il soit vraiment suivi de mise en œuvre concrète. Je vous remercie, Madame la Présidente. Merci beaucoup. United States, you have the floor. Thank you, Deputy Director General. A global migration compact should promote practical recommendations to improve global migration governance. A recurring theme throughout discussions was the need for better implementation of existing standards and frameworks. We do not want to see new mechanisms and administrative structures for funding or policy development created, but we would rather work to strengthen existing mechanisms to import existing support and cooperation for migration-related activities. We must set and pursue realistic expectations. Pursuing lofty commitments that are unrealistic could potentially derail the Migration Compact altogether. A Migration Compact should call for practical actions that states can take to reaffirm in policy and practice the fundamental importance of respecting, promoting, and fulfilling the human rights of all migrants. Where gaps in existing frameworks are identified, we have several good practices that can serve, serve as examples for how to address these gaps. One such model being in the development of the MICIT guidelines, a state-led multi-stakeholder excuse me, multi-stakeholder process that has been highlighted several times over the past days. We have already begun to see the practical benefits of these guidelines through the establishment of several projects that incorporate these guidelines into training curriculum and tools to communicate with migrant populations. It is a priority for the United States to ensure complementarity and to avoid conflation between the refugee and migration compacts. We must account for the challenges faced by both refugees and migrants in mixed migration settings without blurring important distinctions in their status, needs, and rights. It will be important to highlight the roles of UNHCR, IOM, and other UN organizations in responding to mixed migration. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're okay. Thank you, Deputy Director General. And uh, the UK wants to take this opportunity to thank the IOM for organizing this really excellent dialogue. Uh, it's been full of content and we're very proud to have been part of it, so thank you. Um, I want to take the opportunity just briefly to reiterate um, one thing in particular at the beginning, which is that to be clear to this room, as we have been in all of the consultative meetings leading up to the Global Compact negotiations, UK expects the GCM to be a set of non-binding guidelines that help us think practically about how we can collectively manage migration better. And I think 
what this dialogue has shown us is that there's quite a lot of agreement about what could go into that compact, and some of your panelists now have referred to that, and some panelists earlier. Uh, I think we see some agreement that what is needed is not new, necessarily new norms or frameworks, but that what we need to do is work together to get better at implementing the existing protections we have, protecting the rights and uh, reducing the vulnerabilities of all citizens, and of course, including in that, migrants. Um, we, like the US, uh, would agree that there is a, a need that I think has come across here um, to maintain and be clear about the separation of refugees and migrants in the two compacts. Uh, because of the different protections regimes that apply to them, I think it's only by being clear um, we can ensure that we are really looking at implementation of practical solutions of exactly the kind we've talked about in these two days that will actually tackle the issue of, of providing the right protection to migrants in vulnerable situations. This uh, dialogue has brought quite a variety of voices uh, to the floor. We've listened to uh, lots of ideas. We've heard, as I've said, really interesting practical things uh, for what we can do to ensure that protection happens, whether that might be ideas for actions from states or indeed from migrants themselves. Some, I think, might not, in the end, gain full consensus, but I think what's really encouraging is that there's plenty here that we can all agree on. And I think uh, the UK would certainly say that either way, this international dialogue for migration has fulfilled its role in providing us with challenge, asking all of us to challenge ourselves and to think about what those possible solutions might be. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now I give the floor to Denmark. You have the floor. Thank you very much. And, um, I think the discussion over all of the past two days have uh, shown the, fo the importance of focusing on concrete takeaways for addressing the issues connected to migrants in vulnerable situations. I'd like to refer to the EU delegation statement uh, yesterday on behalf of the EU and its member states, uh, where we basically said that we need to have a clear focus on what could specifically be achieved by a global compact on the issues addressed during the workshop, particularly how to operationalize these issues so we can achieve implementation of existing legal frameworks. To go further down that road, uh, it would be greatly appreciated to have even more input from practitioners from local authorities responsible for solving migration issues, such as integration on the ground, as we proceed towards the, the actual negotiations on the compact. Let me then point to three specific takeaways from the discussions over the last two days. First of all, and I, here, here I think we're in, on, in line with other preceding speakers, we very, very much support the statement made by UNHCR, particularly the need for upholding the distinct, distinction between refugees and migrants. It's important that we do not put the international protection regime for refugees at risk. That's my first point. The second point, we also greatly appreciated the statement made by Director General Swing, clarifying that we are not looking to create a new category of vulnerable migrants, but rather address implementation gaps in practice for migrants in vulnerable situations. The third point is that this discussion has contributed towards operationalizing the goals that we have set in the New York Declaration helping us achieve a realistic outcome for the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. But let me add that even though these, of course, are complicated issues, we do not have to invent the wheel meeting after meeting. In the New York Declaration, we have already agreed, both on the scope and the modalities for what we have discussed over the last two days. We agreed in the New York Declaration to consider developing non-binding guiding principles and voluntary guidelines consistent with international law on the treatment of migrants in vulnerable situations. And that is the direction we have jointly set, all 193 member states, and this is the direction we should take. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ethiopia, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, we believe that uh, with regard to the takeaways we have seen that we need to have a very balanced view of migration. Uh, if we take the case of Africa, much of the migration happens within the African uh, continent. And uh, there are also, uh, as presented by His Excellency uh, Mr. Mahabub Malim, there are regional peculiarities within uh, each region. For instance, within the IGAD region, there are uh, uh, cross-border mobility of people 
because of climate-induced uh, drought and uh, a pastoral way of life. Uh, I think we need to uh, take into consideration these uh, peculiarities in, uh, well, as we move along uh, in uh, drawing the contours of the global compact on migration. I think uh, the other issue is the issue of the human rights. Uh, we have seen that uh, we have uh, sufficient instruments that, uh, that cover the situation of uh, migrants uh, in, in different scenarios, uh, including migrants in vulnerable situation. So the issue is all about uh, implementation and policy coherence in this regard. We have seen that there is no mutual exclusivity between sovereign prerogative of states in allowing who is coming to their country and who is not. And within <coughs> in honoring their commitment to human rights instruments. It's, it's also emphasized that the importance of having uh, an innovative multilateral governance framework and the inadequacy of the current existing mechanisms is, uh, I think, uh, w was quite clear. And uh, in addressing vulnerability, we have also seen that uh, individual and situational uh, uh, matters should be taken into consideration. Uh, my probably my question uh, to Engineer Mahbub is uh, the IGAD region has done a very good work in laying out uh, a regional policy instrument, but there are gaps in uh, implementation, in collaboration between several national and regional authorities, and there is also a knowledge gap in, uh, in, uh, in with regard to determinants of migrants, uh, migration, and uh, the complexity of addressing. Uh, issues. And also there is the issue of capacity and uh, I would like to hear from Engineer Mahabu what IGAD is working to address these uh, issues. Thank you. Thank you, Tepe. Uh, Sweden, you have the floor. Deputy Director General, I'd like to come back to a few points that was raised by Foreign Secretary Hack. And I think it was very good that he reminded us of the weighing of interests in, in doing this. We have to make sure that we address the situation, migrants in vulnerable situation and ensure them human rights. At the same time, we have to address issues of sovereignty and security. And I think we have to also weigh in the public support for the policies that we are actually pursuing. Another thing that I think also was raised by Foreign Secretary Hack is the, the call for a UN system-wide coherence, which is important. And of course, that is also homework to all of us to make sure that we have a whole of government approach in addressing those issues. I also would like to come back to what a lot of other delegations raised before me on the need to build on existing norms, first and foremost, and to make sure that we implement those norms. That is where also the, of course, consistency and coherence of, of our own systems and the UN system comes in. Thank you. Thank you very much, and give the floor to Colombia. Gracias, eh, señora Presidenta. Solamente porque escuché comentarios que hacían referencia como a conclusiones, pensé que las conclusiones venían en la próxima, pero para evitar eh, riesgos de malas interpretaciones, que quede claro que nada está definido si ese pacto global va a ser vinculante o no, eso lo vamos a decidir allá, y que quede claro o no que no hay consenso en cuanto a que no se van a crear nuevos compromisos jurídicos vinculantes, eso también está por definirse. Era eso nomás. To conclude a round of uh, very short interventions to the panelists. I think mine is, the, is just to call upon uh, governments represented here and those who are not here, who eventually have to be part and parcel of the global mechanisms, uh, to institutionalize processes within uh, that then enables ownership and enables support and enables uh, financial resource mobilization in this very important subject if we have to even scratch the surface. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Toy. Yeah. From a private sector perspective, I'd like to thank you all for letting us participate in these uh, important discussions, and we will continue to be very much involved in the GFMD business mechanism. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Uh, just two very brief points. The issue of um, combating trafficking and smuggling has come up uh, throughout the, the course of the discussion. Um, and I just wanted to mention that the fifth thematic session, which will take place in Vienna um, in September, um, addresses that issue specifically. Um, so hopefully we will get uh, more thinking around um, how to move forward on those issues. Um, the other issue that I wanted to emphasize was um, the importance of expanding legal pathways for regular migration um, as a means of reducing irregular migration. And that has come up a bit in the discussion over the past few days, but it's a, an essential element. And that issue is going to be discussed um, in October at the sixth thematic session here in Geneva, I believe. Thank you very much. I, um, I'm extremely happy and, and delighted to uh, see the comments that were made uh, on all of our presentations. One thing is very clear, that uh, there is an issue that we all uh, politically committed to deal with, which is help migrants, protect their rights. So there's no dispute on that. There were times when we were not had that consensus. So that's a big uh, positive. Now, how the negotiation will go, as the, our distinguished uh, colleague from Colombia has rightly pointed out, we are yet to decide. We all will have a discussion, and we'll see which way is the best way to protect the rights of migrant workers. Uh, and, and, and possibly uh, our, uh, our joint wisdom will guide us in the a, in a right path. Uh, there's another issue that I sort of, a, sort of a share my own views about it. Uh, yes, there will be two compact, uh, one for refugees, one for migrants. But these two cannot be developed in silo. There has to be a proper coordination and coherence between the two. I think in the past we have made a blunder, if I'm allowed to use the word, by not having proper coordination between the two organizations and between the two flow of people. And that's why we have a problem now. We don't know when someone becomes refugees, become migrants, and when uh, that particular person becomes uh, traffic victims. So this time, I hope that uh, we all will uh, have the joint wisdom to uh, make the proper coherence between the two silos. Otherwise, uh, in the New York Declaration, we wouldn't have uh, put the two together. They would have still be separate the way we developed in early 50s. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, again, thank you very much for, for being here. And uh, I would like to, to really start by thanking all of you and, and all, obviously, uh, the active participation that you have had and the engaged way in which you have participated in these two days uh, IBM. I would also like to, to thank very much all the key actors of the GCM process, uh, the President of the General Assembly, uh, the Special Representative of the Secretary uh, General, uh, the two co-facilitators, the two uh, ambassadors of, of uh, Mexico and Switzerland, because I think these have obviously been led with a, a, a very exemplar way and in a very inclusive manner, and really with inspiring leadership that is guiding all of us and putting all our efforts together to try to get towards a balanced and comprehensive global compact on migration. Uh, this was, as several of you know, the second of the International Dialogues on Migration scheduled uh, in 2017 as part of the contributions that uh, IOM is doing to the preparatory process of the global compact on migration and in response to the call on, in the modalities resolution to use IOM's principal policy forum on, on migration to gather views from all relevant stakeholders for consideration by member states in the elaboration of the Global Compact. The discussions and numerous valuable views and the experiences that were shared during this workshop highlight really the importance of placing the rights, vulnerabilities, and agency of migrants at the center of the international community's effort to address migration in a holistic and comprehensive manner. I believe that the ideas that, we ha that have emerged in, uh, at this IDM can make 
an important contribution to the elaboration of the Global Compact. The range of views expressed at the workshop no doubt improved our understanding of the kinds of vulnerabilities migrants face, as well as existing and potential measures to reduce situations of vulnerability and respond to the protection and assistance needs that migrants have at different stages of their migratory journey. Yesterday and today, we heard inspiring and valuable remarks from His Excellency, the Deputy Minister Mohammed, His Excellency, Minister Hussein, Her Excellency, Minister Thomas, Her Excellency, the Minister Barak Fall, the representatives of diaspora and civil society in the Migrants' Voice panel, and from many senior experts and distinguished representatives of government, civil society, international organizations, academia, and the private sector. Together, they, contribute, they contributed critical views and enriched this timely discussion with their experiences. I wish really to thank all of them again for having made time to join our discussion and present their important views. To summarize the main conclusions that have emerged uh, from this rich dialogue, I would like to highlight seven main takeaways. The first one is that migrants are not inherently vulnerable or uniformly victims. It is important not to generalize or stigmatize. Rather, migrants are heterogeneous human beings with rights, agency, and capacities, and not a homogeneous vulnerable group. Appropriately, discussions have been, have been migrant-centric. Migration is, after all, about people. It is about how and why people move. Our efforts here to look at situations of vulnerability is not intended, as we discussed before and was detailed by the Director General, a new category of vulnerable migrants for international protection. Rather, we need to understand and identify situations of vulnerability for migrants and their impact to achieve well-managed, safe, and orderly migration. Identifying and talking seriously situations of vulnerability for migrants is a matter of responsibility and of common sense to ensure effective protection of their rights on the ground and safer and more orderly migration. Equally important, you underline the importance of distinguishing between refugees and migrants, given the separate legal frameworks involved and the need for international protection in the case of refugees, while recognizing that, in practice, migrants and refugees can experience many of the same vulnerabilities. Many speakers emphasized the need to address the vulnerabilities caused by being in an irregular situation by creating more legal pathways for migration. Discussions highlighted the need for the international community to better clarify the concept of vulnerability, considering each individual migrant's particular situation, the factors that contribute to that vulnerability, and the factors that contribute in their resilience. Speakers highlighted the need for stakeholders to differentiate the responses to vulnerabilities, distinguishes, distinguishing between those that require an immediate short-term response and those that require prevention and long-term consideration. There is a need to consider implementation of a standardized pre-departure and post-arrival orientation for migrant workers that empowers them with information regarding the migration process, life in the country of destination, and the rights and responsibilities in the workplace as, a, and as residents. Many of you agreed 
that responding effectively to the immediate needs of vulnerable migrants demands also appropriate programmatic responses and distribution of tasks. Building national and regional responses on a shared and comprehensive approach that addresses the root causes of vulnerable or vulnerabilities are important steps to be taken. Moreover, the importance of comprehensive, inclusive migration policies at the national level was stressed. Towards this aim, promoting a whole of government and a whole of society approach is necessary. Considering the role of local authorities, communities, civil society, private sector, and the migrant associations themselves. The fourth takeaway is that while policies and operational frameworks are important, they must be implemented in order to address vulnerabilities. Several of you said that there are already a robust international legal framework. The key challenge is not really creating new norms, but rather effectively implementing those that already exist, regardless of a migrant's administrative status and ensuring in practice the rule of law. Applying instruments available to ensure respect for human rights of migrants at borders in return, readmission and post-return monitoring and establishing accountability mechanisms. Existing legal frameworks protect all individuals regardless of categories, and all individuals are right holders. But effective implementations needs to be better geared to meet the needs of vulnerable migrants. An example of these is the need to implement measures to regulate labor recruitment, including the ratification of the Convention 181 on private employment agencies. The fifth takeaway is that successful integration and social inclusion are critical to address and mitigate migrant vulnerabilities and promote migrant resilience. This message resounded strongly at the first IDM event in New York in April and was reiterated again by many discussions over the last two days. Migrants are an integral part of today's societies, and if well integrated and included socially and economically, they are more likely to find the needed support to be less prone to vulnerabilities and to be more resilient. If well integrated, they can contribute to development and prosperity of the destination country. At the same time, respecting, protecting, and fulfilling migrant rights is itself a powerful means to facilitate social cohesion, respect, and future development. In this sense, as our distinguished panelists from Spain, Ecuador, UK, Ireland, US, and Kazakhstan showed us in today's panel on integration, we must acknowledge and promote the role of integration, inclusion, access to health services, education, linguistic and cultural skills as important means to reduce situations of vulnerability on the ground and to enable them to contribute to the development of both their destination and their origin country. It was noted that vulnerabilities can also apply to citizens. Fixes put in place for citizens should also apply equally to migrants. This should take the form of measures to foster self-resilience by pledging to expand opportunities for migrants, especially the most vulnerable, to access as appropriate livelihoods opportunities and labor markets without discrimination and in a manner which also support host communities. Equitable access to health for migrants can reduce, and, uh, uh, can reduce the social costs, improve social cohesion, and protect public health and human rights. 
state, diaspora, private sector, civil society, health personnel, schools, and local institutions have all a crucial role in combat combating all forms of discrimination against migrants, rejecting all hateful rhetoric and narratives to avoid marginalization of migrants and combat it in line with relevant domestic and international laws. Our speakers today presented valuable practices in doing so. The sixth message that we want you to take away is that international cooperation is at the heart of the GCM. The GCM is an opportunity to strengthen cooperation between all stakeholders to ensure the effectiveness and coherence of the efforts of the international communities in support of vulnerable migrants. Many of you called for better coordination between all parties. International cooperation, including bilateral cooperation, measures to respond to cross-border migration flows are essential to GCM and to addressing vulnerabilities. As the representative of Italy and the Philippines mentioned, there is need for a shared responsibility. When dealing with such a complex and dynamic phenomenon as migration is, especially when we look at the great challenges that migrants and states are faced with, one can only agree that cooperation and coordination are the only realistic option to respond to this quickly and efficiently. The GCM comes in, it, in at this timely moment to strengthen states' commitment on migration and enhance cooperation with all stakeholders involved. And the last, uh, uh, the seventh and the last takeaway is the need to carefully plan the implementation phase following the adoption of the Global Compact for Migration. As many of you rightly pointed out, a global compact without implementation and monitoring instruments would be an empty exercise. We must ensure that commitments made are fulfilled and follow up on. The GCM should set goals, benchmarks, and propose review mechanisms to ensure or measure progress. To this end, we would need data and concrete tools to measure the progress of implementation. In conclusion, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we must place migrants and their rights, vulnerabilities, needs, responsibilities, and capacities at the heart of our efforts and address migration comprehensively, including in relation to development, humanitarian, climate change, and peace and security matters. The Global Compact for Migration presents a historic and unique opportunity for the international community to reach common understandings and clear commitments to manage the global phenomenon of migration in a safe, orderly, and regular manner through a comprehensive cooperation framework. A more elaborated summary of the discussions and proposals gathered in the past two days will be shared with you in the coming days. The outcome of this discussion and of the first workshop will be consolidated in a publication that we will aim to, to finalize in time for the stock-taking conference in December in Mexico to inform the development of the Global Compact on Migration. I would like to thank again all of you and all the panelists for all the contributions that you have made. It was a great to have such a numerous of audience here during these two days. And finally, uh, last but not least, I would really like to thank all my colleagues in IOM that have made this event possible. I know a lot of them that you have seen here and here, but there are a lot behind and in front that have made this event possible and the organization, a smooth organization of all these two days. 
So thank you very much again. Thank you for coming. Have a nice trip for those that are going back to your countries. This session is closed.